And what is your name? What is your name? What is your name? Lurleen. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Lurleen. Happy birthday to you. So I was thinking as we were singing about Jesus' birth and how we're having birthdays now. And I, how many of you follow me on Facebook by any chance? Great, thank you. Bonnie Duell page, D-U-E-L-L. -L. And I wrote something that will be there this week for my birthday that is just a brief story of how <clears throat> my mother found herself pregnant in 1938 and she was not married even though she loved my father and I did not know about this until about 20 years ago and it was a family secret and so um, there she was 20 years old no husband and my birth father or I could call him the semen donor. He, <laughs> he, he, and I never met him. He sent her money to get an abortion. And she put it in the back of her dresser drawer. She lived with her parents in Chicago. And she would open that drawer and look at it every once in a while and ponder what to do. And then she decided to spend it on herself. And she rescued me from a brutal and barbaric death by abortion. And I am so thankful. So, And I brought some product with me, not a whole lot. I didn't want to pay for the shipping. So <laughs> I have two books of the of seven of the books that my husband and I wrote and put together. And this is one of them called How to Flow in the Supernatural. And it, how many of you heard Dave Duell when he was here? He was here at Cornerstone, and he was here at the Cowboy Church, his very last time that he ministered. And then he graduated to heaven six years ago. But these books are still relevant. And powerful. They are ten dollars each, and you can get them online when the ones I brought are gone. Plus, we have flash drives, and they are bundles. And uh, so, if you're computer savvy, you can get one that's on relationships, one's on finances, one's on healing, one's on grace. And this one on relationships has in it four D four CD set relational toolkit. Would you read this, Tam? Uh, two CD set, loving relationships, one CD set, who's the boss? Two D CD set, God's will in your home, two CD set, building relationship with your father, two more CD sets, and throw yourself a party PDF book. Yeah, so those are going for $20, and that's a lot of product. It's a special for you. And these are two of my four daughters. Tamara is the oldest. Do you want to say how old you are? I will. She is 62 years old, and Julie just turned 60 this year. And so they're senior citizens Thanks. right here. <laughs> Quite amazing, isn't it, that your children become senior citizens. And I have around 30 grandchildren because we adopt, we brought in. My youngest daughter is adopted from Korea. Her daughter, one of her daughters is adopted from China. And then they brought in relatives and... Uh, yeah, we just expand internationally. And uh, 
there are about 20 great-grandchildren. As soon as they're conceived, I count them. <laughs> and Tamara had uh, married someone who was married before, so with that came a lot of children and grandchildren, and then same with Julie. So yay, I get to be the grandparent. But today, what we're going to do is talk to you about breathtaking wonder. Breathtaking wonder. And this came about, I want to tell you how we got this title. First, I'm going to spread out these notes so we know where we're going. Now I'm mixed up already. OK, here we go. There they are. All right, so my so Tamara's daughter, Savannah, just got married in August, a beautiful wedding. She married a young man that she met at our youth camps, which we host every summer for a week, by the way, in the mountains of Colorado. And the young people's lives are changed. Julie and her husband are in charge of the youth camp. Then they have traveling youth camps throughout the country. Anything you want to say about that? Yeah, so we're having our, our uh, we have a once a year youth camp. It's July 18th, and it's just for a week, and it's up above Colorado Springs. It's for all youth 11 and up. And so if you guys have youth who would love to come to camp, it's, um, if you knew my dad, he was a, a man of supernatural. He knew the power of God, and so we just carry that on and teach that to the kids and how the power of God comes and, and uh, how they can flow and how they can flow and, and see miracles mm -hmm. and so uh, that's awesome if you have any questions you can ask me and then like she said we take it on the road we go to like Kansas and Texas and and take a van full of kids down and, and do a weekend camp during twice a year so it's and just then awesome. then in January there is what we call vertex and that's for young adults who are out of the camp age oh, that's right mm -hmm. so coming up this is a little ringy, and so are you, Mom. You kind of ring. Um, Not my fault. No. But there is, uh, it's January, is it 9th? Yeah. The second Seven. week, it's 7th, 7th through 9th. the 9th. And there is a, um, it's for 18 and up if you're out of high school, and it's a weekend retreat in Colorado as well, up above Winter Park. And it is just a weekend of, kids coming together and loving God and seeing, once again, the supernatural and lives changed. And so that's, it's called Vertex. Yes. Okay, I also have a free newsletter on the table that gives the, the details of Vertex. And we have a world conference. We have a network of churches and ministries that my husband and I started years ago. And when he went to heaven, I just kept doing what I normally did before. So uh, we still are doing that. And we have a world conference in June in Colorado, in the mountains. OK, so that leads me to what this breathtaking wonder, where it came from. Savannah got married. She met this young man at youth camp, her husband. And they planned to move soon, so I offered them my lower level apartment. You know how some people call it a basement? And I thought, no, it's a lower level apartment. Doesn't that sound more elegant? Yes. And it is. And so they are living down there. And I live on the upper levels. And uh, they were up one time, not too long ago, talking. And Daniel said to Savannah, Savannah, you've got to stop gasping so much. You're always going, <gasps> And I said, Daniel, she learned that from her mother. Her mother is always, you're driving along, and she's the driver, and, and, and you're peaceful. And then she'll go, oh, and I, oh, what happened? You know what it does to you? It just it, it gets your emotions, and you think, what's going on? Are we in the, going to have a wreck in a minute? Or, or what is it? Gatsby. So then I was reading in Matthew. And I found out that there are reasons to gasp and that we should be gasping breathtaking wonder that comes to us. And this was in Matthew 7, and in the footnotes it, it said, well, 
the verse said, by the time Jesus finished speaking, the crowds were dazed and overwhelmed by his teaching because his words carried such great authority, quite unlike their religious leaders. And it went on to explain that this comes from the Greek word expleso, and it's a strong verb that means awestruck, filled with amazement, astonished, panic-stricken, something that takes your breath away, being hit with a blow. So there are things about God and Jesus and what he's done for us that should elicit a response in us. It should hit our emotions, our whole body, and we should go, oh, glory to God, thank you, Jesus. So we're going to give you some of those things. And by the way, when I walked in, I saw them written on the wall, the scriptures that we had written down and in the other room. And I think that's just terrific. One more thing before we go on with gasping. This is gasp worthy because, okay, connections. How did we get connected here? How did it happen that we were invited to come here or pressured by Peter and Leanna? They pressured the leadership, I think. So <clears throat> the way that it happened was, here I am, a girl in Chicago, went to school there because I had a brain fog and didn't know you had to apply to college after I graduated high school, didn't know. And the school I wanted to go to, Wheaton College, was full, and they said, you're accepted, but you have to go somewhere else for a quarter and then come back, and there will be room. And my grandparents knew about a Swedish Covenant school, North Park College on the north side of Chicago, and they paid for me to go there, where I met my husband, Dave Duell, who came from Colorado, and he wanted to be a thousand miles away from home so he wouldn't have to do chores at night because he lived on a farm and a ranch and they would have to, he, he got up at 3.30 in the morning and milked 400 cows and then you had to do that again at night and then raise all the feed during the day, the crops and so forth. So he dated every girl on campus and, and then I got to be the lucky one. So then we moved to the farm in an eight by 34 foot trailer, had babies, and eventually the baptism in the Holy Spirit changed our lives. And he wasn't interested in cows anymore. And he wasn't interested in horses and cattle. And he started ministering to people instead. He'd pray for cows too. Neighbors would have a sick cow, Dave would go, pray for the cow. Neighbors would have a sick horse, he'd go, pray for the horse. And then he prayed more for people, then we started a church, faith ministries, and I was incredulous when he told me we would start a church, and I said, what are you talking about? A church that meets on Sunday? He had a Bible study going, and I wouldn't go because I knew they were doing crazy things like speaking out loud in tongues, like lengthening legs, things like that. And he said, yes, we're going to start a church. I believe God wants us to start a church. And I said, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. Don't ever speak of it again. And uh, so God took us away to Christ for the Nations, where our daughter knew she was to go, Dallas, Texas. We went for six weeks, and God spoke to my heart and said, there's a world to be reached. And I am willing and able to work through your farmer husband or anyone else who's available. Amen. And I started getting the picture. I said, okay, I'll talk about starting the church. And then we were sitting with our Presbyterian friends around a table, holding hands, praying. No one understood how we could do this. They took the Dave was a, on the, the uh, board. What, what do they call them? No, not that. It doesn't matter, Julie said. Something like that, yeah. 
and the, the elders, he was on that, and they met with him and said, you're going to starve to death, you can't do this, and so forth. So I was getting weak, and we were praying, and a message came through Dave and said there's time, we were holding hands around the table, there are times on this earth when I require you to drop the hands of those you love from around your table so that around my table in heaven, there will be more hands to hold. And I started getting a greater picture because I loved our Presbyterian friends. I didn't want to leave them. But that's how God called us to start the churches. Then we left Greeley, Colorado, where we met Ginny in Greeley, Colorado about 40 years ago. She came to the church and she tells me that I invited her to our home. And so there's connection. Then we moved to Denver, Dave and I, and started another faith ministries. And Julie helps us with that. Tamara does. And then we went to Europe. We traveled with Andrew Womack Ministries. And we were on the plane the first time going to England, landing in London, and... Dave said to me, I believe the Holy Spirit said we'll be coming here many times. And I scoffed in my heart and said, <laughs> sure, it took a miracle to get us here this time. Down the road, some years later, we come it up and we had been to England over 50 times. We ministered with Andrew for 20 years around the world for weeks at a time. And so in England, one of these meetings, it was a minister's conference, Peter and Leanna showed up. They were living in Vienna, Austria at that time. And we got to meet them. And Leanna said, we're planning to move back to the States and we're coming to your church. And she told me afterwards that Peter said, couldn't we talk about it? Can we talk about it first? Yeah. She was right, though, as usual. <laughs> Another divine connection. Then Peter and Leanna were offered the position here, Peter was, with the South Dakota Symphony Orchestra. He's their creative director. And they moved up here this past year. And we were looking for connections of people that they could become acquainted with, friends that they could have here. And I called, or I texted, I don't call, by the way. I text, I message, I do all of that. And those are my, when I say I call, that's what I mean. And I called Ted Nelson and I said, Ted, who is your contact in Sioux Falls? Ted and Georgie Nelson. And they told us about Ginny and and Randy, and about Verna and Bud. And so I said, well, hurry, contact them. We need this right now. And Ted did it, and they helped Peter and Leanna move in, and it, it's just a miraculous thing, the whole thing. Connections, God's connection. It's so fun to look back and see how he orchestrates things. <gasps> and so here we are today. Yes! <laughs> So when you feel like, as we go through this, just go, <gasps> gasp worthy, breathtaking. Breathtaking. breathtaking, breathtaking. Wonder is a surprise that people feel when perceiving something rare or unexpected, strange or new. In Luke, it says, everyone was awestruck and stunned to see such power and the majesty of God flow through Jesus. <gasps> Gasp worthy. So in Psalms 33, uh, it says, Now with breathtaking wonder, let everyone worship Yahweh, this awe-inspiring creator. <clears throat> words he breathed and world, worlds were birthed. Let there be, and it was springing forth the moment he spoke. So you think about all the awe and breathworthy thing, awe, just that are in the creation and, and the world around us. And so, you know, all you have to do is go to the internet and you find out some really breathtaking, awe-inspiring things. 
Did you know that your fingers have no muscles? They're controlled by the muscles in your arms. Wow. Did you know your, your nose can remember 50,000 different scents? Or that if you spread, there's a wrinkly cover around your brain, and if you spread it out flat, it would be as big as a newspaper. Do you know your skin is as heavy as wearing four winter coats? Or that when your nose gets runny, you cry because the tears form and the eyes drain into the nose. Did you know any of this? This is the wonder of creation. This is the wonder of our bodies. Wow. That if all our blood vessels in our body were laid out in a line, they would reach around the world twice. I mean, I can't even comprehend that. Every second, your body produces 25 million cells. Every second. Ah. Do you know the strongest muscle in your body is your jaw? So all these things, you start looking around, and it's just awe-inspiring wonder. It makes you gasp. No, that's just our human body. It's one piece of creation. How about animals? Did you know that the heart of a shrimp is located in its head? Didn't know that. That a snail can sleep for three years. That slugs have four noses. That elephants are the only animal that can't jump. And that the fingerprints of a koala are so indistinguishable from humans that they have on occasion been confused at a crime scene. So these are the gas, the wonder of the world around us. We're not just here, you know, just to barrel through and get through to heaven. There is a world around us that is gas-worthy. And this is just a, a tiny, tiny drop in the bucket of what the world around us offers for us because God made the world. Then he made Adam and Eve, and he put us. He made the world for us. We're supposed to be here. So when it gets hard and dark and whatever, you think, no, this, is, this world was made for me. I'm here. I'm supposed to be here. Yeah. This is my place, yes. my time. Yeah. My chance. Yes, let's everyone say that. This is my place. This is my, my place. place. My time. My, my time. time. My chance. My chance. Yes. You only have one life, right? That's right. Yeah. Julie always used to say, too, can you imagine this God who didn't just make one tree and go, here, enjoy that tree? He made thousands of different kinds of trees. He made thousands of different kinds of animals and fish and all for dogs, us to enjoy. Even dogs. And They're people. just also, yeah, people. Not That's right. Mic. It's all gasp worthy. It's all just an incredible, what, we're, we're here and it's amazing, right? So right now we're getting ready to celebrate one of the most breathtaking wonders of the world. It is. It is the, yeah. one of the most breathtaking wonders is when Jesus came yes. as a man, mm -hmm. as a baby. And I'm just going to read the story. It says, that night in a field near Bethlehem, shepherds were watching over their flocks. Note, Luke was the only one to mention the shepherds. At that time when Jesus came, most of the shepherds were considered at the bottom of the social status. They were right there with the poop scoopers and the tax collectors. And so it was really something that Luke mentioned the shepherds. And in the, when in, in the Old Testament, shepherds were honored because they were strong and they were brave. And it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And how he leads me in pastures, he does these. So those shepherds at that time were still brave and they were still strong, but they weren't very high on the social ladder. And so then it says, however it is, oh, let me keep doing. That night in the field, shepherds were watching over their flocks. It is believed that these shepherds were temple shepherds. And these temple shepherds worked at a place right outside Bethlehem where thousands of pure spotless lambs were raised for temple sacrifice. And right after a little sheep was a little lamb was born, they would examine the lamb, wrap the lamb in swaddling clothes and claws, and lay it in a manger until it calmed down, so that it would not hurt itself or bruise itself or maim itself. And they it is said that isn't it amazing that it could be that the angel appeared to these priestly shepherds. And when they said this, it says um, suddenly 
An angel of the Lord appeared in radiant splendor before them, lighting up the field with the blazing glory of God. And the shepherds were terrified. Probably they were all going, (gasps) (laughs) But the angel reassured them, saying, Do not be afraid, for I come to bring you good news, the most joyous news the world has ever heard. And it is for everyone everywhere. For today in Bethlehem, a rescuer was born for you. He is the Lord Yahweh, the Messiah. You will recognize him as a miraculous sign. You will find the baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a feeding trough. Wow. The, the priest probably went, these priestly shepherds who yes. had been trained for these spotless lambs probably went, what a miraculous sign. Our Messiah is laying in a trough wrapped in cloths that we wrap our little baby lambs in. I just think that's amazing that God is a God of detail and he could do that. Yep. He could do that. Yes. <gasps> Everyone gas. <laughs> wow, glory it's, to God. It's with breathtaking wonder and significant that God handpicked these shepherds to first hear the joyous news of yes. this Messiah. Yes. Then it says, you know, here one angel appeared, and you probably can't hardly talk then because this amazing person is in front of you. Then it says, then all at once, in the night sky, a vast number of glorious angels appeared, the very armies of heaven And they all praise God, saying, Glory to God in the highest realms of heaven, for there is peace and good hope given to the sons of man. When the choir of angels disappeared and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go. Let's hurry and find this word, this Messiah who's born in Bethlehem, and see for ourselves what the Lord has revealed to us. So they hurried off and found their way to Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in a feeding trough. Upon seeing this miraculous sign, it was a sign to them, the shepherds recounted what had just happened. Everyone who heard the shepherd's story were astonished by what they were told. You know, even though the angels were breathtaking, can you imagine an army of angels start singing, Glory light up the sky, yeah. saying, there's peace, you guys, peace. And Luke is the one who talked about the peace offering, that Jesus came as our peace offering. And you know those little lambs that they um, uh, sacrificed? There was a peace offering. And the peace offering was also called the communion offering where they could take and partake of the offering. And so there's God, peace offering many years, you're allowed to partake, and then Jesus comes and said, this is my body. Take, eat. This is part of communion, part of my peace offering with you. Do this in remembrance of me. Just all the little details that are just so gasp-worthy. And how John said when he saw Jesus coming, he said, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. So that gasp-worthy, breathtaking breathtaking. wonder of the world. Yeah. So in John, I'm reading from John 1, 14 to 18, and that's on the wall in the other room, I believe. And so the living expression, that's Jesus, became a man and lived among us. We gazed upon his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, overflowing with tender mercy and truth. John announced the truth about him when he taught the people. He's the one. He's the one I've been telling you would come after me, even though he came far up, ranks far above me, because he existed before I was ever born. And from the overflow of his fullness, we received Grace heaped upon more grace. Moses gave us the law, but Jesus, the anointed one, unveils truth wrapped in tender mercy. No one ever before gazed upon the full splendor of God except his uniquely beloved son who is cherished by the Father and held close to his heart. Now that he has come to us, he has 
unfolded the full explanation of who God truly is. If anybody ever says to you, well, I don't know what God is like or who he is, you say, look at Jesus. Jesus is the one who fully explains God. Not Job in the Old Testament, not anyone in the Old Testament. They didn't have the privilege of knowing. But Jesus, who walked on this earth, who became human, the Son of God became the Son of Man. And he walked on this earth and showed us what God was like. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. That's Jesus. That's God. That's God. So isn't that incredible that, you know, because everybody in the Old Testament had a part of God. They saw in part. But then it says that when Jesus came, he was the full expression of God. And so if we have any questions, because there are a lot of questions, right? We don't understand everything. Things happen. And. The world blames God. They say, oh, you know, yeah. your, your little family member died. Well, it must have been God. Need an angel. You know, because yeah. the world, we don't understand a lot of things. But one thing we can understand is that God, Jesus, was God incarnate. And so he, if you have any questions, let's say, did Jesus ever give anybody a disease? No. No, he didn't. Did Jesus ever break somebody's leg? No, he didn't. So these are the things that if you don't understand, at least you can go and see, wait, Jesus went about, like Mom said, doing good. Doing good. So that is what God's plan for us is. So I, I love this in Romans 8, 1. It says, now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of our own. Let's see. Oh, sorry. I had outlined it, and, it, and it's not outlined. Um, there remains no accusing voice of our, our condemnation against us who are joined in life union with Jesus. Let's stop and say, oh, that's so no nasty. condemnation. So that means that if the voice in your head is yes. condemning you, it's not from God. Because there remains no accusing voice. Because how many of you know that just because you think something doesn't mean it's true? Just because you feel something doesn't mean it's true. And it's something we all have to learn because our feelings are so strong and our thoughts are so constant. But if you know who you are, if you know what God says about you, then you can know, wait, there is no condemnation. There's no accusing voice. It has been taken care of through Jesus. And that means that what happens to us is our language changes, our our verbiage changes. We don't say what the world says. So then when these uh, uh, condemning thoughts come against us, we can turn around. If we know the truth, if we know the Bible, we can say, we can counter those thoughts with the word of God, with the word of truth. Because it's like when I was, um, I have friends and we would get together for coffee and there were three of us. Well, you know, even as adults, sometimes a, a three, you know, it, it, somebody feels left out. So I got the thought in my head and the feelings to match it <laughs> when I went to coffee that they didn't want me there, that it was just, I was just the third wheel. And I sat there, and you know what that does when you listen to that? It shuts you down. Mm-hmm. So I just shut down. I was sitting mm-hmm. there all quiet and stuff. And I just, I, I left there and said, no, I am loved and highly favored. I am, you know, people love me. People go out of their way to be good to me because I know God. And so I, call, I called one of my friends, and I told her what I thought. She goes, oh, no, no, not at all. But see, that's what happens. We get tricked into thinking this is truth because our thoughts are so intense in there. You know, I forget how many thoughts, but we have thousands and thousands a day, and we have to have something to counteract what goes on in our heart and in our mind. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, and then strongholds. When you entertain this kind of thought, strongholds get built up in your mind, and then you can hardly do anything about it. And so right now, I break the strongholds that are in your mind. If you thought of something where you're trapped, you're trapped. And in Jesus' name, I break those strongholds from your mind. And I say they are dissolving now, and they will no longer affect you, and you will be able to think according to what God says, not your feelings, not your thoughts. That's right. But, you know, I didn't learn to play the piano overnight. And if any of you have ever studied a skill, basketball, you don't learn it overnight. This is actually a skill to be learned. 
how to manage your thoughts, mm -hmm. how to manage your feelings. It's a skill and you have to practice. So when these things, you have to know the word of God. I yes. have peace with God. I am righteous, like Bud was saying. I'm mm -hmm. righteous. There's no condemnation. You have to have these in your heart so that when these thoughts, number one, you can recognize them because sometimes yes. they're so subtle. You don't recognize what's yeah, going on true. until you start feeling bad. And they're like, why am I feeling bad? Oh, because I thought that they were rejecting me or I thought that you know, whatever I was in fear or whatever it is. So it's a skill to learn how to not do this. And one of my favorite verses is Romans 8, 28. And this is the Passion Translation. And it says, so we are convinced. That's a big word, convinced. We are convinced. I am convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan. Okay, there it is. God's perfect plan. Does anybody know, want to know what it is? What is God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives? That's gasp worthy. Yep, you mean God's plan for me is to bring good into my life? Let's stop and guess. <gasps> that is a great plan. And the details and, you know, all the things that come with that, he, he'll reveal. But really, when we know, and another version said, uh, what does the other version say? Everything, well, okay, my version says everything always works out well for me. Because when I'm up against a situation that doesn't look so well, I say this truth to my circumstances. Everything works out well for me because God's plan is to bring good into my life. And, you know, every time that I have had a situation, which I have nine kids so and 17 grandkids, so there are lots of situations that happen. And um, when I come up, though, if I remember my truth, my truth, so, so the world has their truth, and we have our truth. And our truth is gas-worthy. Our truth is above. My, my truth is that God is going to work this for my good. Wow. So I can just believe that beyond what I'm seeing. And I cannot tell you how many times I have to say this to myself and, and know this is my truth. No, my truth. My truth is that I am accepted. My truth is God is my father. I'm a, ch I'm a beloved child. My truth is that there is no condemnation. And this is a skill that I've had to learn because those thoughts never stop. They really do never stop. And so I have to have something to say, no, that's not true. I know it's truth. God's perfect plan is to bring good into my life. I love that. I love it. So we're talking about breathtaking wonder. What's a breath stealer? Mm -hmm. Anxiety. Fear. Mm -hmm. It's an emotion. Worry. And it steals your breath. Because... It's an unpleasant feeling of dread over anticipated events accompanied by tension, inability to catch one's breath. Mm. And what have we felt these last few years? Yeah. A lot of breath-stealing anxiety, breath-stealing mm -hmm. fear. Yes. And, and is that of God? No. 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 And fear is like fight, fight or flight. You know, you see a bear oh, I got to run, or I got to be careful, or whatever. It's that immediate fear of, I've got to take care of myself, where anxiety is pondering and creates doom and gloom. That's when anxiety is, you're creating doom and gloom. What if? What if this happens? And I just, um, Max Lucado explained that anxiety is angst going up a hill. And when you get to the top of the hill, you have no breath you're not able to breathe. So you're thinking anxious thoughts, anxious thoughts. You can't breathe. You can't breathe. You start, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. God made you more for than a life of breath-stealing angst and mind-splitting worry. And I think we've all been tempted to be anxious these past few years. We've been tempted. You hit with some kind of um, thing from your doctor, and it's a temptation to feel anxious. And about 10 years ago, about this time, was the first time I was told that I had breast cancer. And I was tempted to feel afraid and to, tempted to be anxious. And it was stealing my breath because the anxiety was, what if I die? What if I don't get to raise my kids? What if I don't get to see them graduate from high school? And all those things started going through my brain. And that's when God said, be anxious for nothing. And I was like, 
what, not, I can't even do this for 10% of the time? <laughs> no, it says be anxious for nothing. And so um, anyway, at that time, God gave me Psalm 37, and it says, keep trusting in the Lord and do what's right in, your, in his eyes. Fix your heart on the promises of God, and you will be secure, feasting on his faithfulness. And I heard God say to me, when you will be secure, how? By feasting on his faithfulness. And I heard God said, did you just take a bite out of fear? And I said, yes. And he said, spit it out. I only want you to feast on my faithfulness. Okay, so spit out fear right now. Anytime it comes, remember God says, spit it out. And it says, give God the right to direct your life, and as you trust him along the way, you'll find he pulled it off perfectly. And you know, um, at that time, God told me what to do. No chemo, no this. I went for another year. They found a mole. It was breast cancer, so I had to have another little surgery. I'm not going to feast on fear. And then recently, found cancer again, and so I decided, heard God say radiation, yes. And so, you get a mess. And I had a mastectomy and all that. And radiation, yes. And so I did that. And I believe that because of me feasting on his faithfulness, I would not have been afraid at all. And radiation was not fun, but you know, God was with me all the way. I have pictures, but she won't let me show. No. <laughs> but let me see. No, that's it's so good because, um, you know, the story in Matthew where Jesus talks about the wide path and the narrow gate, you know, and I've heard a million sermons on what that means and people have different things about what that means. But what I see it as, because he talks about perfect love before that, everybody, I mean, the world is worry, fear, anxious. That's the easy way. How many find it easy to worry? Go to, man. How many find it easy to be afraid? Go to. That is the easy road. And everybody wow. takes it. Wow. Even people That's a good revelation. That's gas word. Even people who know God, they yeah. take that road and God says, Don't fear anything. Yeah. Nothing. That's a big word. Big word, God. Nothing. And then he says, you know, be anxious for nothing. Those are all big words. And and that's where we're supposed to live. And and that's the narrow gate because Hardly anybody will really take the time to not, to purpose not to be afraid, to purpose not to be worried, to purpose not to be anxious or offended or all the things that it's easy to do. It's just easy to do those, those things. It's hard to do God's way because God says, don't be anxious about anything. Well, that's hard. That takes some work. That takes a little, that takes skill. It takes work to keep your peace. And Jesus said to his disciples, listen to me, never let anxiety enter your heart. Never worry about any of your needs, such as food or clothing, for your life is infinitely more than just food or, or the clothing you wear. Take the carefree birds as your example. Do they ever see them worry? They never, neither grow their own food nor put it in a storehouse for later. Yet God takes care of every one of them, feeding each one of them out of the abundance of his love and goodness. Isn't your life more precious to God than a bird? Be carefree in the care of God. Yes, and it says, and in Psalm 46, surrender your anxiety. How do we get rid of our anxiety? It says, saturate in be saturated in prayer throughout each day. Offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. And it says, keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic, real, honorable, admirable, beautiful, respectful, pure, and holy. So it's our job to keep our hearts fixed mm -hmm. on all those good things. Mm -hmm. Anxiety comes, no, my heart is fixed on the goodness of God. My yes. heart is fastened to what Jesus says. That's good because we, we don't talk very much about personal responsibility. And it's not that God comes in and makes us do anything. Even in the Old Testament, he says, choose life. You know, I set before you life and death. You choose life. And we think how funny that is that we, he has to tell us which one to choose. Yeah. But it's just so easy to choose death. It's so easy to choose fear and worry. And so 
it's one of those things, our personal responsibility is to know what God says about us, which you're learning here, which is amazing, and then to then actually apply that. Because you can know it and never do anything with it, but God doesn't make you do it. You have to talk to it. You have to yeah. say, no, I'm not going to be afraid of this. God, help me. He always helps us, but, it's, but he doesn't make us not worry. You know what I'm saying? That's our job, personal responsibility. Recently, I, I, I spoke, meaning I texted a friend and said that this certain situation I had felt dumb and so forth. And she wrote back and said, I don't remember seeing that scripture. <laughs> and that really helps. That's how you can help each other. I don't remember seeing that scripture. So um, to close, and we have two closings, this is Romans 5, and what I'm saying here is everything changed at the cross. Yeah. Everything changed at the cross. Romans 5 says, For when the time was right, the anointed one came and died to demonstrate his love for sinners who were entirely helpless, weak, and powerless to save themselves. So if you feel help and weak, if you feel helpless, weak, and powerless, great. Just say, Jesus, you take care of this, and he will. For our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us, and he now declares us flawless in his mm -hmm. eyes. Say that out loud. I'm flawless in God's eyes. I'm flawless in God's eyes. Talk about guest worthy. Yeah. This means we can now enjoy true and lasting peace with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus, the anointed one, has done for us. Our faith guarantees us permanent access into this marvelous kindness that has given us a perfect relationship with God. And that's what God's will is for us, that we have relationship with him. It's not religion. It's not a set of rules and laws. It's relationship. He's your father. He did all of this for you. And so that guarantees us this perfect relationship with God. What incredible joy bursts forth within us as we keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. And glory is God's view and opinion, which is reality. And we're experiencing that. <gasps> oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But that's not all. Even in times of trouble, we have a joyful confidence. And that is what Bud and Verna had when their son was hit with this aneurysm. That wasn't God doing it to him, to teach him something, to mold him into something. I had a friend from Africa in my home for breakfast this past week, and she's a leader of, of a church and a school of 800 children in the slums of Nairobi. And she started saying, and God's been beating me down. And, and she looked at my face across the table and she just laughed. Because I was, <laughs> Helen, what in the world are you saying? And so she stopped <laughs> right then. I, she, I caught her yeah. in a lie. Yeah. <laughs> what? Busted. 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 Yeah. That's right. So we have joyful confidence knowing that our pressures will develop in us patient endurance, and patient endurance will refine our character. Proving character leads us back to hope, and this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. His love is always cascading into your heart endlessly glory to god thank you jesus so good and i just i had a word for somebody um because this applies to family members too tell me being the mother of nine and 17 grandkids i could worry a lot 
you know, for them, or I could take on their concern. But one thing I learned is my name isn't Savior. <laughs> I don't have that name, but I know somebody who does. And so if there's someone in here who's carrying the concern of your family or your children or your grandchildren, the Bible, God says, come to me. You know, if you're carrying burdens, you are not to do that. We know someone. His name is Savior. He's the Savior, and we're not supposed to carry other people. We're not supposed to do for them what they won't do for themselves. That's what God does. So I encourage you to really, if you're, if you're worried, if you're concerned, all those things are that burden we carry when we can't make somebody do something. We can't make our kids choose the best way. We can't make our grandkids. But we can turn that burden over and have confidence that God is going to do that. So we just release all those burdens for our family. And we say, I know a Savior, and it's not me. Thank you, Jesus. And yes. then I got this verse, and I wrote it down it's probably for the same person. And it's Proverbs 14, 26 through 27. It says, confidence and strength flood the hearts of the lovers of God who live in awe of him. And their devotion provides their children with a place of shelter and security. Where's that at? Some, Proverbs 14, to worship God in wonder and awe opens a fountain of life within you, empowering you to escape death's domain. But when you are living in awe of God and not fearful, it provides a place of shelter and security for your children. So I just think that when our children see us living, like Julie said, then they they don't if we're worried and anxious all the time, our kids pick up on that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So focus on the glory of God, the majesty of God, and everything that is breathtakingly wonderful. And we're closing now with Savannah, who is Tamara's daughter, singing Thank You, Jesus, for the blood. And we'll be available afterwards to pray for anyone who needs it. She's singing on the video. So I am going to be singing a song called Thank You Jesus for the Blood. And I fell in love with this song last year when I kind of started really chasing after Jesus on my own. And it still makes me emotional. And I've been practicing for many days. And I pretty much cry every other time I sing it. So um, we'll just hope that the Spirit is in me right now and working through me. And I mean, even if I do cry, it's a it's a cry worthy thing. It's a gasp worthy yes, thing. Oh, but yeah. what Jesus came and did for us makes me extremely emotional. Just to know that our destiny was to not be to be separated. That I mean that's how the like our earth was cursed. That was how we were. And God loved us and cared about us enough to come and send his son to die for us so we could be in relationship with him and go to heaven and experience the goodness that he has for us. So, here we go. Hmm. I was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide But from the far side of the chasm you held me in your sight So you made a way Across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne To build it here inside And there at the cross You paid the debt I owed Broke my chains Freed my soul for the first time I had hope. 
Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. Now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life brought me from the darkness into glorious light. There is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood. The blood that calls us sons and daughters we are ransomed by our Father through the blood, the blood. There is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood that calls the sons and daughters we are ransomed by our father through the blood the blood thank you Jesus for the blood of life thank you Jesus it has washed me white Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory.